Now let's move on to our next topic for the video that is DHCP. Okay, so DHCP is a protocol and it stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So DHCP is a network management protocol used to dynamically assign an internet protocol address to any device on a network so they can communicate using IP. Now DHCP automates and centrally manages these configurations rather than requiring some network administrator to manually assign IP addresses to all the network devices. So DHCP can be implemented on small or small local networks as well as large enterprises. Now DHCP will assign new IP addresses in each location when devices are moved from place to place, which means network administrators do not have to manually initially configure each device with a valid IP address. So if a device with a new IP address is moved to a new location of the network, it doesn't need any sort of reconfiguration. So versions of DHCP are available for use in the Internet Protocol version 4 and Internet Protocol version 6. Now, as you see on your screen is a very simplistic diagram on how DHCP works. So let me just run you down. DHCP runs at the application layer of the TCP IP protocol stack to dynamically assign IP addresses to DHCP clients and to allocate TCP IP configuration information to DHCP clients. This includes subnet mask information, default gateways, IP addresses, domain name systems, and addresses. So DHCP is a client server protocol in which servers manage pool of unique IP addresses, as well as information about client configuration parameters, and assign addresses out of those address pools. Now DHCP enabled clients send a request to the DHCP server whenever they connect to a network. The clients configured with DHCP broadcasts a request to the DHCP server and the request network configuration information for a local network to which they're attached. A client typically broadcasts a query for this information immediately after booting up. The DHCP server responds to the client request by providing IP configuration information previously specified by a network administrator. Now this includes a specific IP address as well as for the time period, also called lease, for which the allocation is valid. When refreshing an assignment, a DHCP client requests the same parameters, but the DHCP server may assign a new IP address based on the policy set by the administrator. Now, a DHCP server manages a record of all the IP addresses it allocates to networks, nodes. If a node is reallocated in the network, the server identifies it using its media access control address, now which prevents accidental configuring multiple devices with the same IP address. Now, DHCP is not a routable protocol, nor is it a secure one. DHCP is limited to a specific local area network, which means a single DHCP server per LAN is adequate. Now, larger networks may have a wide area network containing multiple individual locations, depending on the connections between these points and the number of clients in each location. Multiple DHCP servers can be set up to handle the distribution of addresses. Now, if network administrators want a DHCP server to provide addressing to multiple subnets on a given network, they must configure DHCP relay services located on interconnecting routers that DHCP requests to have to cross. Now, these agents relay messages between DHCP client and servers. Uh, DHCP also lacks any built-in mechanism that would allow clients and servers to authenticate each other. Both are vulnerable to deception and to attack where rogue clients can exhaust a DHCP server's pool. Okay, so let's move on to our next topic and that is why use DHCP. So I just told you that DHCP doesn't really have any sort of authentication, so it can be fooled really easily. So what are the advantages of using DHCP? So DHCP offers quite a lot of advantages. Firstly is IP address management. A primary advantage of DHCP is easier management of IP addresses. In a network without DHCP, you must manually assign IP address. You must be careful to assign unique IP addresses to each client and to configure each client individually. If a client moves to a different network, you must make manual modifications for that client. Now when DHCP is enabled, the DHCP server manages the assigning of IP addresses without the administrator's intervention. Clients can move to other subnets without manual reconfiguration because they obtain from a DHCP server new client information appropriate for the new network. Now, apart from that, you can say that DHCP also provides a centralized network client configuration. It has support for boot TP clients. It supports of local clients and remote clients. It supports network booting. And also it has a support for a large network and not only for short, like small scale networks, but for larger networks as well. 
So that way you see DHCP has a wide array of advantages, even though it doesn't really have some authentication. So because of these advantages, DHCP finds widespread use in a lot of organizations. Okay, so that winds up DHCP for us. So let us go into the history of cryptography now. So let me give you a brief history of cryptography. Now cryptography actually goes back several thousand years before shortly after people began to find ways to communicate. There were some of us who were finding ways to make the understanding of that communication difficult so that other people couldn't understand what was going on. And this led to the development of Caesar cipher that was developed by Julius Caesar. And it's a simple rotation cipher. And by that, I mean that you rotate a portion of the key in order to generate the algorithm. So here's an example. We've got two rows of letters and that are alphabetical in order and means we basically written the alphabets down and the second row is shifted by three letters. So a B is a Z actually, because if you move that way, a B is a Z from the first row gets shifted back to the second row and then the letter D becomes the letter C. So there's, that's an example of how encryption works. So if you try to encrypt a word like hello, it would look completely gibberish after it came out of that algorithm. So if you count the letters out, you can see that the letter H can be translated to letter L. So that's a Caesar cipher. Now you must have heard of things like ROT13, which means that you rotate the 13 letters instead of three letters. That's what we can do here again. And this is just a simple rotation cipher or Caesar cipher. That's what, of course, the rot stands for. It's rotate or rotation. Now, coming forward a couple thousand years, we have the Enigma cipher. Now, it's important to note that the Enigma is not the word given to this particular cipher by the people who developed it. It's actually the word given to it by the people who were trying to crack it. The Enigma cipher is a German cipher. They developed the cipher and a machine that was capable of encrypting and decrypting messages so that they could messages to and from different battlefields and war fronts, which is similar to the Caesar cipher. Caesar used it to communicate with his battlefield generals and the same thing with the Germans. You've got to get messages from headquarters down to where the people are actually fighting and you don't want it to get intercepted in between by the enemy. So therefore you use encryption and lots of energy was spent by the allies in particular the British trying to decrypt the messages. One of the first instances that we are aware of where a machine was used to do the actual encryption and we're going to come ahead a few decades now into the 1970s where it was felt that there was a need for a digital encryption standard. Now the National Institute of Standards and Technology is responsible for that sort of thing. So they put out a proposal for this digital encryption standard and an encryption algorithm. What ended up happening was IBM came up with this encryption algorithm that was based on the Lucifer cipher. That was one of their people had been working on on a couple of years previously in 1974. And they put this proposal together based on the Lucifer cipher and in 1977 that proposal for an encryption algorithm was the one that was chosen to be the digital encryption standard. And so that came to be known as DES over time. And it became apparent that there was a problem with DES and that was it only had a 56 bit key size. And while in the 1970s that was considered adequate to defend against brute forcing and breaking of code by 1990s it was no longer considered adequate and there was a need for something more and it took time to develop something that would last long for some long period of time. And so in the meantime, a stop gap was developed and this stop gap is what we call the triple DES. The reason it's called triple DES is you apply the DES algorithm three times in different ways and you use three different keys in order to do that. So here's how triple DES works. Your first 56 bit key is used to encrypt the plain text just like you would do with the standard digital encryption standard algorithm where it changes and you take that cipher text that's returned from the first round of encryption and you apply the decryption algorithm to the cipher text. However, the key thing to note is that you don't use the key that you use to encrypt. You don't use the first key to decrypt bit because otherwise you'll get the plain text back. So what you do is you use a second key with the decryption algorithm against the cipher text from the first round. So now you've got some cipher text that has been encrypted with one key and decrypted with the second key and we take the cipher text from that and we apply a third key using the encryption portion of the algorithm to that cipher encryption portion of the algorithm to that cipher text to receive a whole new set of cipher text obviously to do the decryption you do the third key and decrypt it with the second key you encrypt it and then with the first key you decrypt it and so you do reverse order and the reverse algorithm at each step to apply triple des 
So we get an effective key size of about 168 bits, but it's still only 56 bits at a time. Now I said triple des was only a stopgap. What we were really looking for was the advanced encryption standard once again. And NIST requested proposals so that they could replace the digital encryption standard in 2001. After several thousands of looking for algorithms and looking them over, getting them evaluated and getting them looked into, NIST selected an algorithm and it was put together by a couple of mathematicians. The algorithm was called Raindoll and that became the Advanced Encryption Standard or AES. It's one of the most advantages of AES is it supports multiple key lengths. Currently, what you'll typically see is as we are using 128 bit keys. However, AES supports up to 256 bit keys. So if we get to the point where 128 bit isn't enough, we can move all the way up to 256 bits of key material. So cryptography has a really long history. Currently, we are in a state where we have a reasonably stable encryption standard in AES. But the history of cryptography shows that with every set of encryption, eventually people find a way to crack it. Okay, so that was a brief history of cryptography. Now what I want to do is let's go over and talk about AES, triple DES and DES in themselves because they are some really key cryptographic moments in history because there are some really key historic moments in the history of cryptography. Now we're going to talk about the different types of cryptographic ciphers and primarily we're going to be talking about DES, triple DES and AES. Now DES is the digital encryption standard. It was developed by IBM in the 1970s and originally it was cryptographic cipher named Lucifer. And after some modifications, IBM proposed it as the digital encryption standard and it was selected by the digital encryption standard ever since then it's been known as DES. Now one thing that caused a little bit of controversy was during the process of selection, NSA requested some changes and it hasn't been particularly clear what changes were requested by the NSA. There has been some speculation that wondered if the NSA was requesting a backdoor into this digital encryption standard, which would allow them to look at encrypted messages in the clear. So basically, it would always give the NSA the ability to decrypt DES encrypted messages. It remained the encryption standard for the next couple of decades or so. So what is this and how does it work? Basically, it uses 56 bit keys rather than a stream cipher. It's a block cipher and it uses 64 bit blocks. And in 1998, DES was effectively broken. When a DES encrypted message was cracked in three days, a year later, a network of 10,000 systems around the world cracked the DES encrypted message in less than a day. And it's just gotten worse since then with modern computing power being what it is. Since DES was actually created, we already had come to the realization that we needed something else. So along came triple DES. Now triple DES isn't three times the strength of DES necessarily. It applies DES just three times. And what I mean by that is what we do is we take a plain text message. Then let's call that P and we're going to use a key called K1. And we're going to use that key to encrypt the message and use a key that will we will call K1 and we're going to use that to encrypt the message. And that's going to result in the cipher text and we'll call the C1. So C1, the output of the first round of encryption, we're going to apply a second key and we'll call that K2 with that second key. And we're going to go through a decryption process on C1. Since it's the wrong key, we are not going to get plain text out on the other end. What we are going to get is another round of cipher text and we will call this C2. What we do with C2, we are going to apply a third key and we will call this K3 and we're going to encrypt cipher text C2 and that's going to result in another round of cipher text and we will call that C3. So we have three different keys applied in two different ways. So with key one and key three, we do a round of encryption and with key two, we do a round of decryption. So it's an encrypt, decrypt, encrypt process with separate keys. While that doesn't really yield a full 168 bit key size, the three rounds of encryption yields an effective key size of 168 bits because you have to find 356 bit keys. So speaking of that, technical detail for triple DES, we are still using the DES block cipher with 56 bit keys. But since we've got three different keys, we get an effective length of around 168 bits. Triple DES was really just a stopgap measure. We knew that if DES could be broken, triple DES could surely be broken with just some more time, I guess. And so the NIST was trying to request a standard that was in 1999 and in 2001, NIST published an algorithm that was called AES. So this algorithm that was originally called Raindoll was published by NIST as the advanced encryption standard. Some technical specifications about AES is that the original Raindoll algorithm specified variable block sizes and key lengths. 
And as long as those lock sizes and key lengths were multiples of 32 bits, so 32, 64, 96, and so on, you could use those block sizes and key lengths. When AES was published, AES specified a fixed 128-bit block size and key length of 128, 192, and 256 AES with three different key lengths, but one block size. And that's a little bit of detail about DES, triple DES, and AES. So when AES was published, AES specified a fixed 128-bit block size and a key length of 128, 192, and 256 bits. So we've got with AES three different key lengths, but one block size. And that was a little bit of detail about DES, triple DES, and AES. We'll use some of these in doing some hands-on work in the subsequent part of this video. Okay, so now that I've given you a brief history of how we have reached to the encryption standards that we are following today, that is the advanced encryption standard, let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about DES, triple DES, and AES. So DES is a digital encryption standard. It was developed by IBM in the 1970s, and originally it was a cryptographic cipher named Lucifer. And after some modifications, IBM proposed it as the digital encryption standard. It was selected to be the digital encryption standard, and ever since then, it's been known as DES or DES. One thing that caused a little bit of controversy was during the process of selection, the NSA requested some changes, and it hasn't been particularly clear what changes were requested by the NSA? There has been some sort of speculation that wondered if the NSA was requesting a backdoor into this digital encryption standard, which would allow them to look at encrypted messages in the clear. So basically, it would always give the NSA the ability to decrypt this encrypted messages. It remained the encryption standard for the next couple of decades or so. And what is this and how does it work? Now, DES remained the digital standard for encryption for the next couple of decades. So what does it do and how does it work? So basically, it uses a 56-bit key rather than a stream cipher. It's a block cipher and it uses 64-bit blocks. And in 1998, if you know, DES was effectively broken when a DES encrypted message was cracked in three days. And then a year later, a network of 10,000 systems around the world cracked a DES encrypted message in less than a day. And it's just gotten worse since then with modern computing being what it is today. Now, since DES was created and broken, we knew we needed something. And what came in between advanced encryption standards and DES is triple DES. Now, triple DES isn't three times the strength of DES necessarily. It's really DES applied three times. And what I mean by that is we take a plain text message, then let's call that P, and we are going to use a key called K1. And we're going to use that key to encrypt the message, and that's going to result in the ciphertext 1. So we'll call that C1. Now, C1 is the output of the first round of encryption, and we're going to apply a second key called K2. And with that second key, we are going to go through a decryption process on C1. Now, since it's the wrong key, we are not going to get the plain text out of the decryption process. On the other end, we are going to get another round of ciphertext, and we're going to call that C2. Now with C2, we are going to apply a third key and we are going to call that K3 and we're going to encrypt ciphertext C2 and that's going to result in ciphertext C3. So we have three different keys applied in two different ways. So with key one, key three, we do a round of encryption. With key two, we do a round of decryption. So it's basically an encrypt, decrypt, encrypt process with three separate keys. But what it does really is it doesn't really yield a 168-bit key size because in effectiveness, it's basically 56-bit keys that are being used thrice, whether it be three different keys. So in effectiveness, you could say that it's a 168-bit key, but it is not the same strength because people realize that triple DES can be easily broken because if DES is broken, you can do the same thing with three different ways with whatever key that you use. So it just takes longer time to decrypt if you don't know the key and if you are just using a brute force attack you know that triple DES can be broken if DES can be broken. So triple DES was literally a stopgap between DES and AES because people knew that we needed something more than triple DES. And for this, the NIST or the National Institute of Standards and Technology in 2001, they chose AES as the algorithm that is now called the Advanced Encryption Algorithm. So it was originally called the Raindoll Algorithm. And a, the main thing about the Raindoll algorithm and the advanced encryption standard algorithm is that the Raindoll algorithm specifically states in its papers that it has a variable block size and a variable key size as long as they are in multiples of 32. So 32, 64, 96, like that. 
But what AES does differently is that it gives you one block size that is 128 bits and gives you three different key sizes that is 128, 192, and 256. So with AES, three different key lengths, but one block size. Okay, so that was a little bit more information on AES, DES, and Triple DES. And we are going to be using this information in some subsequent lessons.